Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. This is a long-awaited review and demo for many people, the Gibson Tom DeLonge Signature ES333. Now before we go any further, we need to discuss what on earth is a 333. You're probably familiar with something called a 335, or at least you heard of it and seen it around. How does it compare to a 333? Uh, it's essentially like a 335 Studio or a 335 Faded, but I hate throwing those terms around because those are also different guitars. So just think of it as a slightly stripped back 335. And they didn't produce these things for very long. We're talking like around 2002 to 2005 ish. So what makes these things lesser than a 335? Well, first off, you get your satin finish. That means it hasn't been polished into a full gloss. Now, if you take your polishing cloth and really go to town, you can get these very close to a glossy finish, but it just kind of makes it smooth. It's cheaper to produce. And honestly, as a player, I prefer the satin finishes because you don't stick to it as much. If you ever have issues with a sticky neck or something, maybe try a satin finished guitar out. But perhaps the biggest difference is on the back. You actually have a control cavity back here. Looks kind of ugly, but makes it a lot easier for them to produce these things. Other than that, spec differences between the ones of the day, they had different pickups. They had the 490R, 498T series instead of the 57 classics. And they were just less fancy in general. We're talking most of them didn't even have pickup covers. There's no pick guard stock from the factory. Instead of a fancy mother of pearl Gibson inlay with a crown, it's just a blank Gibson silk screen. As far as body construction goes, it's identical to the 335. You still get the binding, you've got the center maple block, it's the maple poplar maple sandwich of woods, it's all good to go. And all those specs made for a great player's guitar. But if it wasn't for Tom DeLonge, I don't think we would ever be talking about the ES333 because he made this his signature guitar with Gibson. Now, if you're not familiar with Tom, just a quick recap. He's been with Blink-182, Boxcar Racer, Angels and Airwaves, kind of a pop punk rock type of guy. And he has a huge and loyal fan base. But when he adopted the ES333, quite clearly, he made some changes to it to make it his own. This model debuted in 2003 and lasted until late 2009. You might find in early 2010. And perhaps the biggest change he made is he ditched the neck pickup. You still have a tenon cover on this one, and then he swapped it from the 498T in the bridge to a hot Dirty Fingers pickup. Dirty Fingers pickups actually originated in these semi-hollow guitars back in the late 70s, so it's kind of cool that he chose this really hot pickup for his bridge. He's also only had one volume control to simplify it even further. Uh, pay no mind to this tone control on this one, it was added later on. And then he added this racing stripe to the front of the guitar. So you've got kind of a brown and cream vibe going on with this thing because you still have the binding along the edges. So it's just kind of like you got cream pinstriping along the edges and you got the racing stripe here, but then check out the headstock. Instead of a boring blank black veneer, they decided just to leave the headstock the natural mahogany color. And lastly here, locking Spurzel tuners. Other than that, I mean, it's pretty much just a 333. So this is what the Gibson production run looks like, but here are some cool never before seen photos of the Gibson original prototype for this guitar that was sent to a fan of the show by Tom's manager. So originally they actually had this orange stripe and it was a rap tail guitar instead of this tuna mannequin stop bar style bridge. And they also did that racing stripe on the back and that actually made the neck an orange color as well. And the face of the headstock, believe it or not, was also orange. Apparently Tom didn't like the orange headstock. I've got to agree with him. In general, I just don't think the bright orange and the dull gray really <laughs> mixes. But it's kind of a cool prototype nonetheless, and he's had multiple colored ones over the years that he's used in different stages. So if you see him playing something different than this one, it's just one of his custom orders. So now you know about the ES333 and the signature guitar. It's just kind of a cool rock punk guitar, and you're ready to buy one. What is the market for these things? Unfortunately, this is one of those models that suffers from the current artist signature models curse of the 2000s into the early 2010s, where they made limited productions of 
up and coming artists, relatively. I mean, we're not talking the Jimmys like Jimmy Page or Jimi Hendrix or golden era heroes. We're talking the modern day heroes. Buckethead, Ramstein, even a Nickelback signature guitar. They made very limited productions of signature models of up and coming artists, you know, current day things. And unfortunately, they just did not make them enough. So these things suffer from hyperinflation. Now, it's not all the signature models, but the biggest offenders are the original Chris Cornell 335s, the Tom DeLonge 333, the Buckethead Studio and Signature Les Pauls, Roxy's another one that gets scalped, the Dave Grohl Trini Lopez in Pelham Blue, the Neil Sean Les Pauls. And the reason for these prices going crazy is simply because there's not enough supply to meet the demand. But since the fan of these artists are starting to age and get disposable income, it's just becoming a bidding war against each other and the prices just keep going all the way up. So when I say scalping, it's not really scalping because it's the market that determines how much they're worth. So if you're good at predicting who people are going to become nostalgic over in about 10 to 20 years, these guitars can be really good investments. I mean, the Buckethead Signature Les Pauls, brand new, those were like around 4,000 bucks. Today, you're looking anywhere between like six to $9,000. So these guys, brand new, you can take a look at this really old screenshot. They were $2,099. A real Gibson signature guitar. Sure, it's a little bit stripped down, but only 2,000 bucks. How great is that? Are you ready to buy one? Well, sorry, the current used market usually sits between four and a half to seven thousand dollars on these, with five and a half being that golden point where they just get snapped up instantly. And when I mean instantly, this thing took forever for me to track one down at a fair price so I could do this review and demo because these things they sell like that. However, when they discontinued this in 2009, thankfully there is a cheaper alternative. Epiphone started making these in 2008. They're about $599 brand new and they're very similarly specced. Sure, they're not made in the US anymore, but you still have a Gibson USA Dirty Fingers pickup. So that's actually pretty nice. Or at least that was nice for Tom DeLong fans, but unfortunately that was discontinued in 2019. And hey, take a look at what's already happened to the used Epiphones. People are paying a thousand bucks for them. <laughs> so where do we go from here? I think your best bet is picking up an old used Gibson 335 Studio. In 2013, they did a limited edition run that had just a single humbucker and it was very similarly specced, but you're not going to get the binding and you're going to need to refinish it. And if 335s are too big for you, they also made a 339 version so you can make a tiny Tom DeLong. Sadly, neither of these guitars are that common on the used market either. So unless you're handy or you've got really deep pockets, you're likely not going to be able to get a Tom DeLong signature 333. Yeah, maybe check out some of his Fender signature models. But they're just kind of a interestingly specced guitar and I've been enjoying this one so far. So let's go ahead and throw this one on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs before we get to a playing demo. Inside the 333, man, I've been waiting to do this for a while. So underneath your little tenon cover right here, you can see what it implies, the tenon of the neck. That's why they put this little doofy multiply thing over top of it. it. Makes it look a little bit classier in comparison to what you would see if they didn't put it on there. So I think it's a good idea. But what's kind of nice is you can actually see the maple center stripe in the neck. All Gibson necks have that because that's capping off the truss rod cavity. You don't always get to see that though because it's usually covered over in paint. But you can see the plastic is actually slightly affecting the finish and kind of impressing it right there. But I mean, most people wouldn't even take them off anyways. And here we can see our double row of pole pieces, which tells you it's a Gibson Dirty Fingers, as well as the labeling on the outside. But here's what it looks like in here. You can see your maple center block that gets kind of routed out right here for all your pickup stuff. But that continues on right here. So it's built just like a 335. And the top, back and sides are made of that maple poplar maple sandwich and they cap all those off and join them together and then hide all the evidence of that with this nice cream binding. And when we call Dirty Fingers hot pickups, we mean it. 15.43K ohms and no fancy electronics. You can't split it or tap it or do anything like that. It's just one pickup and you go. Now, normally, once again, you'd only have a volume control, so that would be all you can do, but somebody has added a second pot to this one, which means they drilled through the top to install a second pot. 
In my opinion, not a big deal at all. But if you are a huge Tom DeLonge fan, I don't know, maybe that bugs you. But I think it's nice if you actually use your tone. And if you wanted to remove that, eh, you might be able to do a small paint touch up, but honestly, just leave it. Leave it as is. And I do want to disclose that these are not the original knobs. You'll actually see in the first playing demo segment, it had the witch hats that somebody had put on here. As far as the bridge, it's your regular one that was used in this era. It has the PW branding right there. And to be perfectly honest, I'm kind of suspicious of this being the original one, or somebody just had a bad day at the casting factory. <laughs> So it's possible this one's been replaced. And if you take a peek in here, it says Tom DeLong and has your serial number, which dates this one to 2007. And that's about all that's interesting within here. Moving on from our maple poplar maple body, we go to the neck. This is just a straight up mahogany neck. Yes, it does have binding. Yes, they do have fret nibs. And yes, it's still a dot neck. With what looks to be about 22 medium jumbo frets here, regular 12 inch radius. Not too much else to really talk about this except for the rosewood fretboard. Our nut width is 1.68 inches. That increases to 2.08 by the 12th. With the first fret neck depth of 0.81, it stays fairly consistent, 0.89 by the 12th. The truss rod cover of these, they're just blank. They don't say 333 or 335, anything like that. But you can see your truss rod right there, the ending of that maple block. And I love the just natural headstock of this thing. And you get the black silk screen. I wish Gibson would do this on more models. I think it looks better than people give it credit for. Moving on to the back here, I can't help but chuckle. This is like the least effective backplate I've ever seen. <laughs> even though you still get control access in here, it's so hard to reach this stuff. So even doing work on this would be a little bit more difficult than working on a Les Paul, as you'd think they would have the controls down here. But the real reason why they did this is they didn't want you to be able to see through the F hole and see the backplate. So that's the whole reasoning behind this. It's kind of interesting to get to see inside a 335. So you get your maple top right here. Then we can see our maple center block which has some figuring to it there's our output jack and we can even see our bracing along the edges right there that's pretty cool it looks like whoever added the pot actually knew what they were doing because if i had not known better that actually looks like factory solder work and it's a gibson branded pot now this one yeah there's definitely been other pickups in here not quite as beautifully done but hey it functions it functions and then you get your ground wire coming out of your bridge studs right there or your tailpiece studs i'm not really sure which on this one and the back plate on this one, I'm guessing somebody added this. Because I highly doubt Gibson would put this on the back plate because you can kind of see straight through that. But I could be wrong, I could be wrong. I like the back color. I mean, this is kind of like a really muted grayish brown. But I personally really like the mahogany neck. I'm glad they didn't paint that at all. So I guess in the long run, I'm glad they didn't do anything with the back. Now, I believe stock from the factory, you actually get these Dunlop strap buttons. It's kind of hard to tell. All the for sale ads just never show this part of the guitar, unfortunately. But overall, this one's actually in pretty good shape. You can see some light scuffs within the finish, but it hasn't like uh, turned super glossy in very many areas, except for like where somebody's strap has been rubbing. Again, maybe some light scratches against someone's shirt. And at the top here, you do have some picking scratches here if you get it in the light just right. But hey, if you took this to someone to buff it, it would easily become, you know, almost a mint condition guitar again, except for then you wouldn't have your matte finish. But cool, moving on to the back of our neck. It's just a one piece mahogany neck. Can't ask for too much more than that. You can tell this is kind of naturally turned into a gloss finish or at least a semi gloss just by somebody playing it. And the back of our headstock, we can see our Spurzel tuners. This is a 2007 model, so towards the end of the run, because that's a really late 2007. Made in USA, and you get a decal of Tom DeLonge's signature on the back. I like the grain fill they used. It reminds me of the early 80s when they did that yellow grain fill. All said and done, this one weighs seven pounds, eight ounces. So seven and a half pounds. This thing feels really light. Let's go ahead, plug it in and hear how it sounds. But before we do that, I need to introduce somebody. I recently had Michael Weber come over and he did a few playing demos. We recorded about 10 episodes together yesterday. That way, not only do you get my tone demos, but you can also see how somebody a little bit more accomplished at playing guitar can make it sound. Now let's get to it. <laughs> Thank you. 
had to stop it there, or else there'd be no video left and we'd just hold that note for the rest of eternity. But since Trogley has to make other videos, I have to stop playing that chord. But this thing sustains forever. I love this. <laughs> about Tom DeLonge's signature ES-333, what are my final thoughts on this thing? You know, if you're a big Tom DeLonge fan, I think that's the only thing that would justify paying the prices that these things command. Otherwise, I mean, just get yourself a 335, it's a lot cheaper. I mean, there's definitely ways to do this for a little bit less, but I do understand the hype because the more Blink-182 songs I listen to, to see him playing this guitar, I get it. It's the whole signature guitar phenomenon. And now that even the Epiphone version is out of production, I don't see that boating too well for the Gibson versions. So I'm kind of scared to see what might happen to the values of these in the future. But hey, I'm glad I got in on, you know, the mid floor anyways, before these things get too crazy, because what a cool vibe this guitar has. I'm not usually into the whole racing stripe thing, but the whole color scheme for this one works for me. Now this Dirty Fingers pickup, it's kind of interesting. So as far as clean tones, you gotta be careful how hard you hit it. In my playing demo, I never had any type of distortion pedal on or anything. I got that grindy sound just by attacking the strings a little bit harder. So it's definitely a guitar for some punk music. So I hope your chocolate nights enjoyed getting to check this one out. Before we say goodbye, let's go ahead and check it out under blacklight and see the original case. Under black light, not too much going on. That means it likely hasn't been used too much. Sometimes you'll see some sweat absorption in some areas or like in the areas that have been polished a little bit just naturally by playing. So kind of a boring black light test, despite this being kind of old. I guess the one thing that this does help show us better is there is a little bit of stand rash back here. You can just barely see it as like a darker brown color in regular lighting situations, but I'm glad that the black light test is showing us that a little bit more clearly but it does not look like we have uh, any other areas to really go over. It is break, crack, and repair free. So let's go ahead and check out that case. The case for this one is a Gibson Custom Shop case, but we've got good heel support. This is back when Gibson made their cases in Canada instead of China. I mean, these are really nice cases. And hey, this one even has its original warranty pamphlet. So thank you Troglodytes for tuning in to this episode of the Troglies Guitar Show where we learned about the Tom DeLonge ES-333. I definitely like this a lot better than that 339 Studio. I was kind of worried because I wasn't a huge fan of that guitar. But this, you know, maybe it's the signature guitar phenomenon or just learning some new stuff. We're just checking out a guitar that we don't normally see on the channel. I enjoyed it. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Check out Michael Weber on his channels, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.